This is Coogan Cassis for Rifle TV in association with MTK Global. It's the last one of 2019. The last one. Yeah, probably for a couple of days. Yeah, I, I like coming in today. There's no one in today. Did you? Really? Did you really just come in for me? No, no, I like to come in because I put a tweet out about it earlier. Sometimes things happen when you least expect it. And I like to do things like, no one's really working today, right? No. But people are in quite a good mood. Because they've had Christmas, New Year's Eve's come in. Do you know what I mean? Oh. So now's the time to speak to people, make things happen, get things over the line. And I like getting one against the head. You know what I mean? So when you walk out of here today, if you've cleared a load of stuff off your desk, if you've done a few deals, if you've made some fights, if you've finalised some shows, that's one against the head. That's one you probably didn't expect. The other people ain't working today. They're on their holidays, right? They're at home watching TV, they're on a beach. So we can get things done today. One against the head, it's called. I like that. Just gonna have an M&S ginger and apple shot. Shout out M&S. Yeah. Edward. Yes, old boy. Do you know what we're gonna try and do today? What we're we gonna try and do? Okay. We are trying to mention, to give a mention to your whole stable at some point. Okay. I don't know if we- We always, what, what happens in this is, Go on. I always get a text from someone going, mate, you didn't, you spoke about every other fighter and you didn't talk about me. So before we do that, I wanna just say that if you are left out of this video, it is not a representation of how important you are to us or that we don't have any plans for you in 2020. It's just that you or I forgot. We should really have what other promoters have, like a script for your interviews. Where it's like, I must say that, must say that one. Are Make you sure leaving you said, like Salty Herd back in 2019? I'm not Salty. I, there has been no Salty Herd. Right. I think I'm the least saltiest promoter. I mean, I'm a salt, don't get me wrong. But I'm the least saltiest promoter of, of everybody. What was your worst moment, I know you're going to say, of 2019? Well, actually it could be a couple. There's a couple. Yeah. I mean, I think... I think when I look back to the whole Joshua Ruiz, that's the obvious one to say, isn't it? Um, there's a few, and we'll go through them. I think the first one was receiving a call that Jarrell Miller had failed or the first drugs test that we got um, when Vada informed us of that. That was a kick in the nuts because I was really buzzing for the fight, to be honest with you. I mean, the tickets had sold really well. It was the first time I've seen AJ fired up, you know, with the bit between his teeth, really like had that explosion, that beef with another fighter, Madison Square Garden, to zone, you know, just, I was buzzing for that event. And we'd just done the press tour, it was massive. And then obviously we got that call and that was one where, I remember, I remember it really well. I just got home from work and I was in the lounge with the kids, I can't remember what we were playing. And uh, Frank called me and said, mate, just Vardo just called Jarrell Miller's found a drug test. I'm like, it's that moment where I just say to the missus, listen, I need half an hour. And I just went into the room, the bedroom, I just laid down on the bed. And I just sort of just think, 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 what are you gonna do? Fuck, what are you gonna do? And then obviously, call Rob, call AJ, Freddie, etc. Let them know, and then you know that in the next half an hour, this news is going to break. And then it's like, it's not just dealing with the situation; it's dealing with the media. And all of a sudden, everyone's called it. Sky, can you come on live on Sky Sports News? BBC, can you come on Five Live now? Talksport, all the national writers, everybody. And you got one thing that we've always tried to be is accessible. And I will never turn my back on something. You see people just like, I'll go offline. Do you know what I mean? I will never do that. I will always speak to everybody that I can. I'll tell you everything that I know and where we're up to without hopefully, you know, giving a, a strategy or whatever. Something. But sometimes I'm at fault with that because I am open. And I think one of the things that's got us to where we are is our accessibility. So then it's dealing with that. And then obviously going into the event, the next two weeks were really rough because 
Everybody had us over a barrel. We looked at three, four, five guys. We ended up with Andy Ruiz. We were happy with that. He weren't in great shape, but he was a good fighter. This is a credible fight. Madison Square Garden, let's go. Then he got beat. And that was like, you know, that was on June the 1st. And then I just remember on June the 2nd, my missus and my kids went home and uh, they left at like six in the morning to go to the airport and uh, I got up with them, put them in the car, the driver took them to the airport and then I went back to the room and I was just, I just felt like fucked, like really fucked. And then I had Gennady Ganovkin fight week. Um, so I had to go through all the process of that. It wasn't ideal to have a fight. No, like because you don't you. want... The worst thing yeah. you want, when you get some bad news or you want something that everybody wants to talk to you about, the worst thing is putting yourself in a position where you've got no choice but to talk about it. And I don't mind doing the odd call, but then... But you do shows every week. So yeah, but so it's, 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 yeah, exactly. So when you don't want to talk about something, you have to talk about something. This is a job that I'm in. So for that, all I really wanted to do was just shut myself in a room and just sulk. Right and be miserable, but you have to get up, you put the suit on, you go to a media event, and you know, you sit down with thirty people like you, obviously not as not as credible, some of them, and you got to talk to everyone. Oh man, well, no one wants to talk about Gennady Golovkin at this point. Everyone wants to talk about Joshua Ruiz. Then you hear all the bullshit stories. Oh, he got knocked out his spine. Oh, he had a panic attack. Oh, so you're dealing with all that kind of stuff. On that Saturday was my 40th birthday, right? And I woke up in the same hotel, Gennady Golovkin fight day, and I had a card from my kids and my wife, which I opened, and I put it on the side of the bed, and I was like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, fuck, like, you fought, it's your 40th birthday, you're here, you've had a shit week, you're speaking to people you just like you don't even want to have these conversations. You, your family's at home. What what? You know. And then anyway, went to Gnarly Lock Fight Week, come home, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So now we're like middle of June. And I'm thinking, all right, listen, we've got the rematch. Then there's all the problems with the rematch, which you know, like again, the contract was so solid on the rematch, but you just know because of this sport and the business, this is gonna be a pain in the ass. So you have to go through all that. People want to try and get out of contracts, you have to go through legal routes, you know, we go to court, we're spending hundreds of thousands with lawyers, etc. Then you get to sort of middle of June. Then, okay, Dillian White's fighting Oscar Rebus. Okay, right, we're up and running. AJ's got the rematch. We're back at the O2, pay-per-view, blah, blah, blah. All looking good uh, for the show, great show. And then Thursday, uh, afternoon, get a phone call to say there's an issue with Dillian White's drug test. Right? And I'm like, are you fucking joking me? Anyway, go through, everyone knows what happened, had a hearing, he's cleared to fight, etc. At that point, for me, that, that issue was dealt with, to be honest with you. It was a confidential matter, but we'd been through a full hearing and he'd be completely cleared to box. So when we received that news, it was over. Like, I wasn't expecting any backlash of this the next week. Like, we're done. We've gone through the right processes, been dealt with, full hearing, cleared. Fight goes ahead. He wins the fight, done. Good performance, tough for Dillian. Ant slept since Thursday, head completely gone, but got the job done. Then, Thomas Hauser leaks all the information, the confidential information, and then, boom. And where are we? We're in Dallas for Hooker Ramirez, and I've got fucking Andrew from IFL going to me, mate, can we sit down and do half hour? And I'm like, boy, I've got every journal called, what has happened here? Whoa, what have you done? So again, then, and I'm also being told by Dillian's lawyers, you can't say anything because we are now in a position where people are attacking our career, we've been cleared, and we've got to deal with this in the right way. So I can't really say anything. I've got every media from under the sun 
coming to me, asking me questions. So I start off with Andrew, sit down with him, do it, 45 minutes with him, then someone else, then someone else, then we go to the presser, then that dipstick from Finn comes to the presser, Fred, whatever his name is, barbershop geezer, end up probably nearly chinning him. And then I'm just thinking to myself, fuck, this is just going from bad to worse here. Everyone's tweeting, oh, Ern's had a mouth, oh, he's fucking right up against ropes, he's fucked, this, this, everything's going wrong for him. Anyway, do Hooker Ramirez, really good fight actually and sort of the kind of fight that makes you realise why you're even doing this because we love it and then uh, that was July really and that went on for ages like every tweet you put out where's the B sample oh fucking oh and it's just like oh god but what wasn't half the problem is that this obviously the confidentiality yeah. agreement which meant that you were kind of Restricted from what you could say. I, Dylan White's team hadn't really said anything, so. Well, they can't. So basically, the whole situation <coughs> was that I had a contract with both fighters to fulfil a fight. What needed to happen was they were medically cleared for the fight and they were fully licensed to take part in the contest. That was the case. If I don't do the fight, I get sued. But everyone was cleared to fight, everyone was approved, there was no problem. Done the fight. Then after all the knives come out, no one really wanted to listen. No one believed in anything. Everyone just wanted to have a pop. And we had to wait for this process to get resolved. Finally, two days before Saudi, it gets resolved. Everyone finds the truth. No failed drug test, nothing cleared. So that was nice, but it took ages. And for the first month, it was horrendous, horrendous. So anyway, so then, um, everything starts sort of getting back on track. And, you know, we had a couple of really good weeks mixed in with a horrific week with the passing of Patrick Day. You know, um, going from the Alexander Usyk fight, you know, the return, great crowd, etc., to obviously earlier on that card, um, him, uh, Patrick Day passing away, which was a, a gutter for everybody. Not just for us, but for everybody in the industry, you know, it really takes it. And it's probably the only time in the industry where people actually, all the beef or all the politics or everything kind of goes out the window. Because the, bo the bottom line is, not everybody likes each other, but we all love boxing. Like, there's not, for even people that I don't like in the sport, really, from a sort of business ethics point of view, I do know they love the sport. And they do care about the sport. They might make decisions that make you think they don't care about the sport, but the reason they're still going and the reason we're still and you're still going is because we love what we do. We love boxing. So that was a kick in the nuts for everyone. Um, you know, we had the Gennady Golovkin fight um, with Derevchenko, which was just epic. We had, and then a couple of weeks later, we had the Josh Taylor Regis Progre fight. You know, at the end of August, we had. Luke Campbell against Vasily Lomachenko, which, although didn't smash any numbers out of the park, or, I mean, we lost money on that fight. It was important for me to do that fight because I wanted to bring Lomachenko to the UK. I felt like we were getting stick for not bringing big names to the UK anymore, and I thought that was a good opportunity for us to do that. Did the Josh Taylor Regis Progre fight, Fucking hell, it's been a mad year. Then going into the KSI Logan Paul fight, which again was another move that I was like, is it, you know, we're just sort of coming out of this period of pain. And it was, that was actually, when you talk about end of July, Dillian White fight, that was August, September, that was about the same period. So I'm thinking here, with AJ's lost. Dillian White's had this issue, and now you're you're only going to announce in the KSI Logan Paul fight. I mean, are you mad? Like, do you want to just get even more stick? And it was like, I just know this is the right thing to do. So we went ahead with that. That was early November. Um, and it was massive, massive. Such an amazing experience. I think you'll agree. I mean, just mind-blowing. Showing us a completely different world. And there'll still be fight fans going, oh, it was just... But I even think that most people 
were not saying converted, but at least understood the madness behind it by the end of, of this event. And it, cha it changed people's minds, not, fi not necessarily fans' minds, but people's minds within the business. Of saying there is another world out there, you know, we've got to keep the integrity of the sport where we can, but we can't have blinkers on and not realise that the world is changing, and that that event showed that. The blinkers you had on when they had their first fight. Of course, totally. I just thought, what a joke, and I saw it. I saw it when I was. I saw the numbers, and you can't ignore it because if you do, you're a dinosaur. And at forty, I'd like to think I'm not a dinosaur, but you've got to keep that freshness. You've got to somehow have those hardcore fight fans there who you respect, who are knowledgeable, but also have to understand you are a minority. And the only way we grow that minority is to bring in this new audience. These hate these, hate them. These don't even know about these, really. They don't, do they? You know, do you think that some bloke who, who dropped into that event, who took a, the Zone annual subscription who, or turned up to Staples had had a feeling about the hardcore fans that night. No, he just said, I'm just going to an event. See what it's like, is that right? So that was massive. Uh, and then gearing up for the rematch. And again, like this was the same kind of time dropping in the Saudi news. So you've got this whole period where AJ loses, Dillian White and the, the whole Rivas scandal if you like, or people like to call it a scandal. The YouTube event, and now AJ's going to Saudi Arabia. So this was like... That won't happen. Well, one, it won't happen, the stadium won't be ready, but more than that, the stick. Like, so we've gone through this whole period of stick from June to end of August, and that's where really, when I talk about the Lomachenko fight, it was important to us to sort of bounce back with. And then we went to Saudi, and really I'm thinking to myself, fuck me, we have to win this fight. He's got to win this fight, AJ. You know, and that's why it was what it was. I mean, not just from a personal point of view for a guy that I'm very fond of, but of course, for his business, for our business, for Sky, for everybody. And actually, if you're part of British boxing, you, you should have been hoping Joshua wins that night. You really should have, because we all benefit. You know, he's taking the sport to huge levels and people don't give him the credit. British boxing is where it is. Yes, we've been, we've played a part, you've played a part, but he has played a massive part in changing the face and the image of the sport. And we should all be grateful for that. And when he wins, we all win. Not just people that are directly involved, but the sport as a whole in this country. And if he comes back and defends his titles in April, uh, then... You know, he's he's in a he's in a British boxing. He's firing again, and um, and hopefully Fury beats Wilder, and, and and we're all on top, aren't we? So, yeah, that's the year in a nutshell. I mean, there's loads more yeah. that happened, but I'm really going. I mean, that was your first question was what was the the lows, mm -hmm. and that was a low that was four months. I mean, really three months of battling away, believing in what you're doing, and that sometimes. What you got to do, you have to just believe in what you're doing. Believe in the process, have something in your mind that you're focused on. But you have to be narrow-minded. And you know, there were times when I was questioning the decisions that we were making because, like anything, I guess your confidence can get knocked to think, am I actually, am I making the right moves here? Am I making mistakes? Like I'm getting a lot of stick. Am I actually doing something wrong? And that's when you've got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, don't be daft. So you know what you're doing, you're the best at what you do. So onwards, onwards and upwards. And it paid off. And we're fucking buzzing now, to be honest with you. Roll on 2020. Edward, mm. right, so what we're gonna do now, mm. I'm gonna try and reel off as many names as I can. So all I want you to do with this, when you hear a name, kind of sum up their year okay. and what you think is in plan for them in 2020. Yeah, obviously you've got a lot of fighters, so we're gonna do the, I'm not feeling that. That was the bottom bit. Oh, yeah. Ready? Okay. Okay. Khalid Yafai. Whoa, that's a good question. That's a good question. Because five minutes before you walked in, I was on the phone to his team. I heard. Did you? I was out there. No, you weren't. Yeah. 
Um, so, I'll give you a little bit of an exclusive. Cool. And actually, Cal, Cal does know this, but Cal was very unlucky. Cal was signed and confirmed to fight Juan Estrada in a unification fight in Miami on January 30th. Okay? All of a sudden, get the phone call. Another one of those dreaded phone calls. Uh, Eddie, it's from JC at Zanfa. Bad news. Um, Estrada's busted his hand. He needs an operation. It's not going to be available till May. Fuck. This was the one fight that you know we really wanted for Cal. It was his chance to go out there and have that flagship fight, that big money fight. So... Now I'm thinking, right, what, what can we do? So now, January 30th starts to try and pass us by. And it has been six months since he boxed, but it is what it is. Now we move on to Chocolatito. And this is the fight that I'm trying to make for now, February the 29th, on the Mikey Garcia card in Dallas. So, mega fight. And if he can beat Chocolatito, he goes into the Estrada fight in, in great shape, you know, in terms of his earnings potential, in terms of his star power. You know, that Chocolatito fight is really a breakout fight. Not done yet. There's there's interest from um, Honda, Mr. Honda, and Chocolatito to take that fight. We're negotiating. So, there, but there's a very good chance that fight could land on the Mikey Garcia fight. It's a guy that... Three years ago, some people were pointing as the pound for pound number yeah. one. Yeah, still, I mean, look, he, in my opinion, he's not quite the fighter that he was three years ago. Just had a good win by stoppage, very dangerous, huge name, you know. Legend, I mean, certainly in boxing terms, um, just a great fight for Cal Fire. Great fight, great occasion, and I'm very proud of Cal and the job that we've done with Cal in the sense that we took his, you know, another one of those guys we took from the debut at, from the GB, a podium squad, to the world championship. And for a super flyaway, has earned a hell of a lot of money. He's had five defences of his WBA world title. But now, this is the fight that is going to secure him financially, but also the upside of a win. I'm almost, like the Estrada fight, really tough fight, chance to unify. But this fight, if you win this fight, it takes Estrada fight to a big main event fight in America and a big opportunity for you. And I believe he can beat um, Roman Gonzalez. I do. Uh, but I think it's a great fight. And I think it's a war. And I think it would be a brilliant addition to the Mikey Garcia, Jesse Vargas card on Feb 29. I agree. Lawrence Acoli. A revelation. I mean, Lawrence Acoli, it's like a love-hate thing, isn't it? Not with me, but with the fans. You know, one, on one side, he's had a couple of performances where he was a little bit out of his depth and just had to do what he had to do to win. I'm talking mainly about the Matty Askin fight. But on the back of those two fights, which were uh, Lawrence, uh, Isaac Chamberlain, and Matty Askin, two, I say poor performances, I mean he won the fight, two slightly boring performances. I feel like he gets such a hard time from the fans now. Literally, you go into the first round, boom, boom, clinch. Oh, fucking Akoli, oh he's terrible to watch. Boo! This is just what happens. So, he's kind of got that reputation now, even in the last fight for the European title, thought he boxed well. Just beat an undefeated, world-ranked European champion who didn't win a second of one round, and he sparked him out. But still, it's like, oh, he's boring, oh, no, this. He's never going to be Arturo Gatti to watch. But if you want these fighters to move quickly, and if you want them to take chances, don't moan if sometimes they're not quite ready for that occasion and have to find a way to win. Like Joshua. Yeah, a little bit like Joshua, but Cody's dead. Like, Joshua's got a very exciting style. Cody's got an exciting style, but sometimes he's going to lock you up on the inside. And that's, but that's one of his attributes. You can't say to Lawrence Cody, mate, can you stop locking people up on the inside and just have a tear up? What, so what? You can get knocked out for someone's entertainment. No thanks, we want to win. 
That's what matters. I want Lawrence Okoli to win a world title. And I believe in his next fight, he will win a world title. He will fight Kloacki for the WBO world title in his next fight. Give him the credit of how many fights he had? 14 fights? Something like that. So he's going to be challenging for the world title. He ain't ready for Kloacki. But he can beat Kloacki. So give him the credit of saying, fuck me. You've gone Commonwealth, British, WBA International, European champion. Now you're fighting for a world title. Where and when? Possibility of Chicago. Um, if Gennady Golovkin fights Zerometa, that is a perfect fight for a co-main event. Is that going to be in Chicago? Or possibly. Okay. Obviously, Zerometa's Polish. Glowacki's well, also Polish. Much? Yeah. But that's all. It's, everything's being worked out at the moment. But that will be Lawrence's next fight. He's fighting for the world title. So I think... Um, you don't have to love watching him, but give him give him the credit, give him the respect of saying you're moving fast, much faster than you should be moving. So well done. And I think as he develops, I think Shane McGuigan's doing a great job. I think he's going to get more and more exciting. But but you can't take away what sometimes makes him so effective, which is his size, which sometimes he will smother you on the inside. When Andre Ward did it for years. Got a lot of stick for it. Yeah, he did. But look at what he walked oh. away with. I mean, hardly a scratch on his face and a, and a lovely bank account. So, and a legacy. So, let Cody do his thing. I believe he'll win the world title in his next fight. Callum Smith. Callum Smith. It's like a waiting game now for Billy Joe and Callum Smith because I really believe those two are the front runners for Canelo in May. We talk about them in the same kind of thing. Maybe. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you look at Callum, a very close fight with John Ryder. Um, I think at the stage in his career now where he needs those big tests and those fights that are really going to get him motivated um, I felt that Billy Joe is in exactly the same boat went to America I actually had him losing that fight um, I think he was behind on one card and up on two or, it was very very close put together a brilliant knockout to get Caceres out of there and that's if he would have gone through that fight and, and won on points in a close fight, it would have been a real kick in the nuts. Come through it with a great knockout. And Billy and Callum, you know, I said to Joe Gallagher the other day, I said to MTK the other day, just to let you know, like, I'm offering these guys to Canelo. So whatever they come back with, I'm going to be completely honest with you guys, there's no you know, matching one up against the other and playing one off against the other. I'll be totally up front. But basically... You're on the end of a phone waiting for the golden call to tell you Canelo wants to fight you next. And if he doesn't fight one of those guys next, then they should fight each other and they should unify. But I believe he will. So the answer is, what does the other person do? If you're Billy Joe Saunders, do you go and do you try and get a unification fight with Caleb Plant or David Benavides? For me, if the Callum Smith or the Canelo fight wasn't there, I'd probably rather see him drop down to 160 and fight Demetrius Andrade in, in what will be a big fight in America as well. There's other fights out there for him. There's the Gennady Golovkin fight at 168 as well. But I can't lie, Callum Smith and Billy Joe Saunders obviously both want the Canelo Alvarez fight and they're ready to go. But if neither of them gets it, they should unify against each other immediately. Katie Taylor. Katie Taylor, what a year. What a year. I mean, when you look at what she's achieved over the year, and again, like I feel like from a fan's perspective, sometimes you still get like with a pair soon fight, oh, robbery, come on. It was such a close fight. Like, how you can have that fight more than a round either way, I just do not know. But look at the year she's had. And then, again, when, you, when you're asking as a fan for fighters to step up, have career-defining fights, do something outside the box, she goes, Rose Volante and unifies again the 135 pound division. That was in Philadelphia, that fight. Undisputed fight at Madison Square Garden on June the 1st. Then steps up to win a second division weight uh, world championship in November against Lenardo. That's her year. You can't ask for any more than that. Now, my aim for Katie Taylor is to establish her as one of the biggest stars in a sport. Forget female, forget male, just star of the sport. To give her the credibility 
to get her the money that would be groundbreaking within the sport and what I want to see her walk away from the sport with and to set up those big career defining fights. Amanda Serrano, Delphine Pearson, Cecilia Breakhouse. That is the idea of a perfect 2020. The likely chances of those I three. think Serrano has to be next and I think it will be. And I Where? think that will come in April. I think that should be in New York. I think that could be the first all-female main event to headline at the Garden. I think it's a monstrous fight. And that, that could be the year. And if that's the year, no one could ever... I mean, even if you get two of those three. Pursuit's going to the Olympics, which is a bit of a gutter, but let her do her thing. And first things first, let's lock in the Serrano fight. Everybody seems to want that fight. I think Amanda is doing an MMA fight in January. Let her do that. Let's make this fight in, in April. It's a, it's a wonderful fight. But she remains... She was over uh, last week and we had a nice bit of lunch and she's just one of my favourite fighters, one of my favourite people. I take her career very seriously. Um, I'm, I'm incredibly invested emotionally in her career because I feel like everything's a challenge with what we're doing and I'm very motivated to deliver for her. Shannon Courtney. I saw her at the darts last night. Yeah. Um, had a good year. I mean, again, I said about Shannon... When I used to watch Shannon at the Harringay Box Cup, and now I just used to see this raw tearaway that I would really enjoy watching. And she would sometimes tweet me and say, oh, here's my fight. One day I'll be boxing for Matchroom, etc., etc." She didn't reach the heights as an amateur of the likes of Katie Taylor and Savannah Marshall and Clarissa Shields and these kind of people. But she's very engaging. She's very fan friendly. I love her story. She's a good person and she can fight. So there's a lot for her to prove in terms of how far she can go. Sometimes when a fighter comes out of that amateur code and wins world championships, European championships, Olympic golds, you know really, if they don't go on and win a world title, you've probably kind of failed. For Shannon, it would be a huge achievement to win a world title. Can she do it? Yes, I believe she can, but she's got to improve and she's got to learn. She doesn't have, like I say, that blessing of experience that some of the other girls have turning pro. Um, and I think, look, she's got a great trainer in Adam Booth in the Boxing Booth gym. She's trying new stuff. And that's what I said in the interview last night, is that sometimes some of that rawness can make her very effective, particularly in the early stages of what she's doing. So for me, a York Hall performance was probably my favourite performance so far because she kind of moved away from the, you know, all this sort of stuff and just thought, you know what, I'm going to have a tear. Adam Booth might not have liked it and he, she will have to listen to Adam to get to the top because you can't just fight like that in every fight and think that you're going to win every fight. But she's, what, 4-0 and now? 5-0. and 5-0. Um, great start to the year. I've kept her really, really active and for me now, she should have a nice break, come back in March... Um, but very popular, big ticket seller, people really like her, she's infectious, um, again, great story and great motivation for young girls and young young women. You know, she was massively overweight, wasn't she, by her own storytelling, and she got herself in shape, she found boxing, all the things that we try and promote about boxing and spread the gospel of boxing about how boxing can change your life. Speak to Shannon Courtney, speak to Lawrence Okoda, speak to Richard Rep, or speak to AJ, speak to all these people who will tell you without boxing, they might not be here, they might be inside, they might be, you know, whatever. But, and, and again, it's another positive message that one of our fighters can preach about the sport, and I would have no problem putting Shannon in front of schools, young girls, my kids. You know, because they're going to go through the same problems that she went through, maybe psychologically, maybe emotionally, maybe mentally. And it's good, you know, you need to talk. If you're, if you're in a position of weakness, you need to talk. And if you're, you know, emotionally or mentally unstable, the best thing to do is to talk about it. And if you can do that with people that have shared similar experiences, fantastic. Terry Harper. Terry Harper is... is uh, I want to say a rough diamond, I'm not sure that's the right phrase, but 
she's someone that I get a lot of, pe people sometimes think, and, and maybe this goes to some of my fighters, people sometimes maybe think that, does he, does he even know about me, or does he really, like, am I important to match him, or to Eddie? Don't ever underestimate, just because I may not have a relationship with you, like, for Terry. I have got Terry's number, right? The only time I've seen Terry, he's at the shows, at the press conferences, I think I might have sent her a couple of DMs on Twitter, something like that, to say welcome, or congratulations, or etc. So, but she's on my mind, and I'm excited about that. And one of the reasons that I'm excited about her is because I kind of feel the journey that she's on with Steffi. Do you know what I mean? And I know what she means to Steffi, and I know what it means to them as a little unit, and what it would mean to where she's from, you know, up in Doncaster, to go and achieve what she can achieve. But it's not like a feel-good story. I think she's very, very good. I was talking to Katie Taylor about it when she was here. We were talking about Terry Harper saying, we really feel like she's improving. Her confidence is growing. Anyone that wants to give it 110%, I'm on board. Right? If you don't give it 110%, don't expect me to give it 110%. We're all in this together. And with Terry, I really feel like she could be our rough diamond. And I just love the story of she walked away from the sport as an amateur. The opportunities weren't there. Katie Taylor comes back in. Well, actually, you know, there's opportunities for women's boxing. She comes back in, a couple of smaller hall shows. Steffi done a great job, starts setting a load of tickets. We give her an opportunity of a big fight against Open Off. Now she's fighting Wallstrom for the WBC world title. It's a massive, massive opportunity. And she can beat her. It's a very tough fight. But for me, I'm looking at Terry Harper and saying, how can we get Terry Harper boxing in Madison Square Garden? You know, like, what motivates me is seeing Steffi and Terry, right? Like, on the stage at Madison Square Garden, weighing in. Just like, a bit like Tommy Core, you know, when Tommy Core boxed Algeria. I know he didn't win the fight, but did you see him on the stage weighing in? He was just like, <sighs> and I was so close to pulling his pants down when he was on the scales. Do you know, and I just couldn't do it because I just felt this will ruin his, his moment. You know when he done me, right? He's gone in and he's like, and he's stood on those scales and he's gone, and I'm right behind him and I'm thinking, don't do it. I had two people on my shoulders. I had this geezer going, Ed, pull his pants down now. He done you in Boston. This is going viral. Just pull them down. And this guy goes, Ed, don't do that. I know he stitched you up, but this is his big moment, and I've decided not to do it. And I told him after how close I was to just going up. But those moments, that's what makes me happy. Because maybe from an ego perspective, we're responsible for a lot of that. They're putting the hard work in, but we've made it happen. Mm -hmm. So with Terry and Steffi, I want to see them travel around the world. I want to see them make money. I want to see them to live the dream. Quite honestly, it sounds a bit cheesy, but that's, what, that's how I feel. And on, on February the 8th, at Sheffield Arena, in front of seven, 8,000 people, the atmosphere will be incredible to try and see her become WBC World Champion. Savannah Marshall. Savannah Marshall, very excited again as well. Um, again, that feeling that, of Peter Fury, Savannah, I know that she gives it 110%. The difference between Savannah and, say, Shannon Courtney, Savannah's ready. You know, we want to make her against Hannah Rankin next, Going to speak to the board about hopefully making that one of the first British title fights for women's boxing. It's a great fight that really fits that bill. What bill? No, fits the bill oh. of a British fight. Sorry. Sorry. But we're going to be in, um, this is another exclusive, April the 4th, Newcastle. The return of, of Lewis Ritson. Um, big big card up there with MTK. And then, what are you pointing at me? Kelly Avenisian? No, that won't be on that card. Okay. Um, but again, um, Savannah will be on that card. She needs that fight, then she needs to go straight into World Championship fights. Mm -hmm. I want to see her fight Clarissa Shields at the back end of 2020. That is the fight. That's the standout fight in the division. It's the one that has got the great narrative, you know, the, the victory in the Olympics. Those two will, although they had a nice chat on, with your 
uh, IFL. I was a bit gutted about that because I wanted to build a bit more beef, but there will there will be, and uh, she's a very good fighter. Josh Kelly. Josh Kelly is. This is where we get to a stage where I just can't wait because this is it, right? David Avenesian is in the form of his life. Josh Kelly comes off a long break after a draw. Looks okay. I was really pleased with him getting those ten rounds. To be honest with you in, in uh, Phoenix, because I think he needed it going into the Avenesian fight. He now goes into the Avenesian fight as an underdog, right? You've got Neil Marsh, you've got Adam Booth, right? You've got the build-up, you've got, he done this and you pulled out that last fight and this and that. This is a really, really good main event Saturday night fight night where we find out if Josh Kelly is the goods, and I believe he is the goods, but I also believe David Avenesian is fucking dangerous. And right now, David Avenesian believes that he can walk through walls. I saw him dismantle Jose Del Rio at a Barcelona show. Don't get me wrong, Del Rio's not Josh Kelly, by any means, but he's very durable. Mate, he doubled him over with body shots, and he's gonna be a right handful. Avenesian has signed. Josh Kelly has signed. Now we get to see if Josh Kelly can win that fight. Oh man, he goes to fantastic levels, star levels in the UK and around the world. Avenesian is now ranked heavily in the, with the governing bodies. So this is a massive fight for Josh Kelly. Massive fight and a massive fight for Adam Booth. And like I say, they wanted to move quickly. They've moved quickly. He deserves all the credit in the world as well for this fight. I remember when he pulled out the Avenesian fight before, he was sick on the, on the day of the fight. He got loads of stick, all absolute rubbish. He wanted to fight. You don't go through 10 weeks of camp and then on the day of the fight, after making the weight, turn around and go, I can't fight. So he was ill. He got a load of stick, now he's come back. And I said to Josh Kelly, in the hotel, after that last fight in Phoenix, two weeks ago, or 10 days ago, you were the underdog man in this fight, and I looked at his face and he was excited. So let's see. Where and when? End of March, looks like. Um, it's just whether we do, what kind of show, we're gonna be in, in the O2 at the end of March. It all depends on a lot of things. <coughs> Usyk, Chisora, you know, who, who knows with a lot of things can happen. But that fight will take place at the end of March. Have both agreed to drug testing? Yes. It's in their contracts. There'll be VADA testing in place, which will start uh, in the next couple of days. January, 12 weeks. So, Lovely. January 4th. Huey Fury. Huey Fury, uh, up and down year. I mean, I think some people looking at this, uh, look this will say a down year because he lost to Povetkin and then he had to pull out of the fight again on fight day. And that was a gutter for him because of the work he put in. But I don't look at the Povetkin fight, although it's a loss on paper, as, as anything that had a negative effect on his career. He, Simon of us, he was supposed to just have a tick over the fight. The Povetkin fight presented itself. He said, I'm up for that. Him and Peter had a go. I felt like they could have won that fight if they would have stepped on the gas more in the middle rounds. Come out and was due to have yeah, you could say a comeback fight in Monaco. On Wednesday, he couldn't do the um, workout because he didn't feel great. Had some antibiotics. Thursday, Friday felt a little bit better. Hit the pads but weren't really firing. Saturday morning just felt shit. Hit the pads, nothing at all. In the heavyweight division, mate, you can't go in with any kind of level of opposition. Not feeling great and not firing on, it, on, on, on any cylinders. So that was a kick in the nuts, and again, he will be back um, end of Feb, early March, in the same kind of fight, and then in the summer, ready to go. Dave Allen. Dave Allen. The Dave Allen, eh? I mean, what a roller coaster it is dealing with Dave Allen. I mean, firstly, you look back to the Lucas Brown fight. Oh, I mean, when was that? March. March, which was just, you know, our headline, Dave Allen, at the O2. The fuck was I doing? 
but it worked, it sold, the viewing figures were great, and he won by first round knockout. Was it first? Third round knockout, sorry. Oh. Sorry. Uh, yeah, third round knockout. Um, and from there, made the David Price fight. Probably expected him to beat David Price just because I thought he's going to hang tough in the fight and take it late. And I think, can Price do the rounds? Box shit in that fight. I mean, David Price boxed really well. But I felt like Dave just let himself down in that fight because he never lets himself down. But just everything that he worked with with Darren didn't really do it. And Price hit him hard and hurt him a few times. And, you know, and after that fight, you know, it was worrying scenes in the ring. And I kind of thought, maybe that's it now for Dave. I mean, Dave, I know what I've paid Dave Allen. And no one would have expected him to make this kind of money out of boxing. But no amount of money is worth your health. And I'm talking about your physical health in the ring. And I'm talking about your mental health out of the ring. So when we were talking about, you know, the Dubois offer came in, I felt bad that that offer came in because I felt that people should have known better than to make him that offer. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that is the worst fight for Dave Allen. And people, you know, you're, you're, and, and boxing is a brutal sport outside the ring. And I'm saying people are offering him good money, but you know you shouldn't really be putting him in this fight, you know? And again, he's not, anyone's obligation other than the people that represent him. I don't represent Dave Allen, but I class him as a mate and I care about him and I, f I, have an, I feel like I have an obligation to make sure that he's safe. I, f I have an obligation to make sure he gets paid as well as possible, but we all have an obligation, the people around him. And that's why when the Dubois fight came in, I spoke to Darren Barker and we talked and I said, look, you know, if you want to take the money, I understand, but this really ain't the right time for Dave to take a fight like this. And everybody agreed. And now it's about coming back. I feel like that period after the price fight, I think what Dave used to sometimes do was have a fight, something would go wrong, and it's like the only thing I feel like I can focus on is put me in another fight. And then, but all you're doing is masking the underlying problems that might be there in your life or the issues that you're dealing with by, by just continuously fighting. I feel like this period where he's gone from July 20th to now without a fight has put him in a good position. I think he's in a, a better place. I think he's got his, you know, his mates and his younger stable that he's working with up there, the amateur boys, which I think he's great. I think he's got his houses in order and he wants to fight again. And I'm, I will support him. But February 8th, he returns to Sheffield Arena. It will not be a tough fight. I mean, they're all dangerous in that division. But I want him to have six or eight rounds looking good and enjoying himself, you know, and just trying to get to that position. He wants to win a British title. He's going to struggle to beat Daniel Dubois, who's a very good fighter. Probably see Dubois vacating. Somewhere. Possibly. But then Dave could be in a position. And if Dave won a British title, I mean, I was gutted that Dave never beat Lemroy Thomas for the Commonwealth title because I would have loved him to retire as Commonwealth Heavyweight Champion, all right? If I can get Dave Allen a British title, which I believe he can win, then I'll be very happy. But the most important thing for me is that Dave is happy. And right now, we're in a position where I think everybody acknowledges that six or eight round fight is next to see where we're at, to see what you've been working on and to try and gear yourself up for some bigger fights in 2020. Conor Ben. Conor Ben. I was thinking about Conor Ben yesterday. I would have liked to keep Conor a little bit more active than he's been since his last fight. Purely, I think it's just because of the Christmas period has been a bit difficult to do that. I think Conor Ben, there's a lot of things I like about Conor Ben. Number one, Conor Ben has a very successful father. Right? So do I. Conor Ben works his absolute bollocks off. So do I. Conor Ben could have quite easily spunked it up the wall and just been an arsehole, been arrogant, been a sport brat, been a silver spoon kid. So could have I. And Conor Ben is much, much younger 
than probably when I realised what my duties were in life. And what impresses me so much about Connor is his age, his work ethic, his mindset. It's kind of the thing that a lot of fighters would find when it's too late. Does that make sense? And when you get to 28, 29, 30, you start going, fuck. But he's seeing it now. And that's what excites me about Conor Ben. And you know what also excites me about Conor Ben? Everyone thinks he's a novelty act. Right? And I have to be honest, he was. When he debuted, he was all over the place. I mean, he was like, he'd had, what, six or seven amateur fights. Next thing, he's in front of 20,000 people at the O2, walking out as Nigel Ben's son. He is a pleasure to work with. His dad is a legend and a top man who lets his son go out and be his own person. But his dad should be very proud of him because he's working as hard as he can possibly work. He's got money, he's a good looking kid, he's got the fame, and he doesn't act like an arsehole ever. Just a very nice young man who has a dream in the sport. And he will box in March as well, in London, at the O2, and I would like him to fight Johnny Garton. And I'm gonna revisit that, I'm gonna make him an offer, probably in line with what they asked for last time, because I think it's a big fight, I think it's a great fight for Conor Ben, it's a good fight for Johnny Garton, it's a good fight for London, and I would like to see if Conor Ben can beat Johnny Garton, if Josh Kelly can beat David Ambenesian, I really believe that fight could be made into a big British fight. And I'll tell you what, Conor Ben is improving so much, people aren't even seeing the improvements. That's Conor Ben. Callum Johnson. Callum Johnson, again, a stop-start career that is quite frustrating, but he's had his uh, injuries this year, shoulder injury. Brilliant win in March against Shawnee Monaghan, coming off the back of... You know, Callum's better be of performance now looks so so good you know I mean he had him down and hurt he didn't jump on him he could have beaten him in that fight and he was coming off a massive a spell of of inactivity as well comes back to the Shawnee Monaghan fight great performance strong punch very hard there's a lot happening right now in the heavyweight division he's due to fight on March the 7th we're looking to do a show in Manchester uh, Meek, Meek, Meek Halkin the, for the European title good fight tough fight um, and then I believe he should fight for the world title I really feel like Boatsy against Callum Johnson is a really good fight and I'm one that I would like to see in 2020 and could he end up being a, a defence of a world title or even a vacant world title Josh Boatsy is my next person yeah I'm just going to go to the be back in a moment just picking this back up a little lunch stop little break okay. Joshua Boatsy yes um, Boatz is in a great position actually because there's an IBF purse bid being ordered for Better Biev against Fenlong Meng, a Chinese fighter. And Boatz is one behind, so we'll see what happens there. We're going to reschedule this Blake Caparello fight. He's going to be back in March as well. That was a good fight. Really good fight. Yeah. He got ill and unfortunately couldn't take part in that fight, which was due to happen in November. So he's in Ghana at the moment. On holiday, getting ready to start camp. I see 2020 as a massive year for Boatsy. I think he's a brilliant fighter. Someone I'm very excited about. Great, great mindset. Um, I believe he'll win a world, world light heavyweight title in 2020. And hopefully that Caparello fight will be announced soon for March. John Ryder. John Ryder. I mean, off the back of a defeat, which you know, I know Tony Sims felt like they did enough to, to nick that fight. I think he's in a great position. I mean, his popularity is higher than it's ever been. Um, I actually said to Callum Smith and Joe Gallagher that if you didn't get, say Billy Joe Saunders got the uh, Canelo fight, I know that Callum wants that big fight, but the Ryder rematch, a big fight, I mean, that, that could do that could sell out the O2. You know, it would definitely completely ram out Liverpool. And there might be a part of Callum that feels like he wants to put that right, you know, to say to people that doubted him and thought, I didn't win the fight, okay, I'll do it again. And I'll show you. So we'll see what happens over the next couple of months. But I think, well, next month, really, with this whole Canelo thing playing out. But for John, I'd like to see him back probably April, something like that. And I think he should be in a big fight, whether that's stateside. 
Now, you even saw like Eddie Reynoso and mentioning John Ryder's name for Canelo. You know, so he's he's in all those discussions now, and I'm very confident he lands a big fight in the first half of 2020. We know you've announced this person's next fight on February 8th. Uh, Cal Brook yeah. will make his return. Opponent-wise, Ed, does it seem like Cal's going backwards? I think this is a really, really tough fight. A really tough fight. I mean, who was it tweeting about it the other day? Uh, TJ Dehenny, right? Said, you guys, are, this is a tough, tough fight. DeLuca can fight. He's fit. He can punch. He's tough. He's coming to win. He's got those, all those Irish boys behind him. Ken Casey, this is a massive opportunity for them. You beat Kel Brook in Sheffield, you are right there for a world title fight. This is a dangerous, dangerous fight for Kel Brook, who is coming back after a year layoff in a fight that he didn't look great in against Zarafa. By the way, Zarafa went and beat Jeff Horn and then just lost to Jeff Horn in an absolute war a couple of weeks ago. So that win by Kel over Zarafa actually looks better than it did at the time. I'm... Really intrigued to see Kel Brook back because what does he have left in the tank? I believe he's still one of the best fighters in the world. He looks good. And when we talked about Conor Ben's mindset of sometimes you get to that stage where you start thinking, fuck, I need to get my nut down and get working. That's where Kel Brook's at now. So if Kel Brook loses to Mark DeLuca, his career is over. If he beats Mark DeLuca, and he's a favourite to do so, but it's a very tough fight, he will go on, Amir Khan, who knows, but in a big, big fight in the summer. And he will be thrown in the biggest fight possible in the summer. He's just got to get that win on February the 8th. On that show as well, Kid Galahad against Marrero. IBF final eliminators have become mandatory to Josh Warrington. Um, really good fight. Marrero, PBC guy, I won the purse bid for that fight, you know. And um, good fight. And, and and Harper against Wallstrom as well. And Dave Allen, great card that's selling well. February the 8th, don't miss it, Sheffield Arena. Tough fight for Kelbrook. I know it's not really technically your fight anymore, but Amir Khan, what, what's the situation? Still talk. I mean, still looking to do something with Amir. I'd still love to make I think Amir, realistically, when we, t I mean, Amir's still trying to land a big fight in the Middle East. Um, I think realistically, when we talk about the Brook Khan fight, the only chance that fight has of happening now is summer 2020. And Amir should box end of Feb, March, if he, if he needs to, and then go into the Kel Brook fight outdoors somewhere in the UK. That's what I think. Is he looking at what, Pacquiao still? Or? Yeah, I think he, I mean, Pacquiao's a bit up in the air with what he's going to do. I think Amir would love that fight. Um, it's just a case of whether that's, there's enough money and enough interest in that fight to bring that to the Middle East. Charlie Edwards. Charlie Edwards, I think he's had a good break now, looking to come back either at Superfly or even at Bantam, I believe he was talking about coming back at. I mean, again, another fighter that I'm very proud of, signed him from the professional debut as well. Another fighter that we've taken from GB squad to world champion. Um, I thought it was a massive achievement for him to win a world title. He defended it. It was always a struggle for him once he went to Superfly to even come back to flyweight. But when the world title opportunity came, he had to take it. And it was only a matter of time till he moved up in weight. Superfly, Bantam, big fights out there for him. You'll see him back in the spring, um, probably in a 10-rounder, and then looking for a try and win another world title at another weight class after that. Craig Richards, uh, I understand you didn't bid for this fight with Shaq mm. Peters. Why? Because I had a deal in place. It was a bit of a mess, really. What happened was, I made an offer to Craig Richards. We negotiated the number. I got to my final offer. I agreed a deal with Shaq Peters. That deal was done. I couldn't get a deal done with um, Craig Richards and Peter Sims. So... That went to first bids. Uh, John Pegg won that first bid, but apparently filmed, filled out some forms wrong or something like that. So that was void. This was back in like a couple of months ago now. Then all of a sudden, Craig Richards and Peter come to me and said, all right, we'll take that fight December 12th, um, sorry, December 19th, next gen. 
So I went back to John Pegg and Shaq and Peters. I said, good news, that fight is now on. Shaq and Peters come back and said, no, I haven't got enough time to be ready. So I'm like, okay. So I left the fight and it went to first bids. I decided not to bid for that fight because I went back to John Pegg having already agreed a deal with him for Shaq and Peters and said, we're now going to do that fight in March at the O2 and he turned it down. So he obviously had his plan, John Pegg, in place with Mick Hennessy, who won the first bid. I didn't bid for that fight. I think the bid was a good number. Um, it's just now up to Craig whether he wants to take that fight. We've got another, a couple of big options for Craig. So it's whether he wants to do them, which is a much bigger fight than the Pitters fight, or go and fight Shaq and Pitters. So that fight might not necessarily happen? Not necessarily, no. I mean... Um, the option is there. Yeah, the option is there. That's a good fight, and I, I think it's a good opportunity for both guys. So, but obviously, if there's a better option, as always, he would take that option. So, we'll see if Richard's Pitters happens, um, and we'll speak to Peter. And great, great fight against Chad Sugden the other night. Mm. You know, and um, tough for Craig because he's been in the gym waiting for the Pitters fight, and he gets Chad Sug Chad Sugden, who comes like it's the fight of his opportunity of his career felt like Craig won the fight to be honest with you um, but good fight Richard Riakpour Richard Riakpour at the moment has a hand injury off the back of that fight quite a bad hand injury actually I don't think you'll see him back until uh, the summer or early summer of 2020 I feel like he's been great Riakpour well, I know the Massey fight was a little bit scrappy at times but Look at the fights he's been in. You know, Sam Hyde fight, um, Chris Billum Smith fight, um, the Jack Massey fight. Um, there was another. Oh, the Tommy McCarthy fight. Yeah, a Tommy McCarthy win now looks like a big win. Um, so I think Rackpaw's had a brilliant year. Brilliant year. There he is, Tony Sims. Oh, we were just talking about you, Tony. We love you. All good, good, mate. All good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You all right? You all right? All good. Do you want to take that off for a minute? Yeah. Just picking this back up. As Tony Sims has just left us, yeah, yeah, yeah. we can kind of run through Tony Sims' mm -hmm. stable. Uh, Martin Wall, Cheeseman, Cortina. Yeah. Martin J. Ward looking to get... I need to Doctor. find Martin J. Ward a big fight. That's been a bit frustrating, to be honest. But looking to find that in Miami on January 30th. Hopefully have news of that in the next sort of couple of days. The Doc is out February 8th. John Doherty. Very exciting super middleweight. Um, Ted Cheeseman will box at the O2 in March. Um, come back probably in an eight rounder, eight or a ten rounder. Um, Joe Caldina, I'd like to put him uh, in Wales on a big card, sort of early April, something like that. Lee Selby has also got a final eliminator against George Cambosis Jr. for the IBF world title. Um, who else did we talk about? Conor Ben, we, talk, we spoke about earlier. Uh, Charles Franken is going to be back in the new year. What's happened with Charles Franken? Charles Franken's just, uh, he's, had, he's had a little bit of an illness. Um, wasn't 100% was supposed to fight on the next gen show. So just getting that cleared up and he should be good to go in the new year. Who was the other one we talked about? Ted, Connor, John Ryder, we've discussed already. Felix Cash. Felix Cash. Felix Cash looking to fight for the European title against the Italian champion. That'll be in March as well. Let's move to, can do gym by gym actually. Okay. Dave Caldwell's deal. Yeah. Uh, Fowler, Gill. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Gill was out as well. Was supposed to fight at the end of this year. He's going to be boxing in the spring. Hopi Price, great experience from in Saudi Arabia. Unbelievable. Um, great young talent. Very excited about him. He will be boxing in Sheffield on February eighth, not too far from where he's from. So hopefully you get good support there. Uh, Fowler, I'm looking to make the Scott Fitzgerald fight for May or June. We're looking at either Liverpool or uh, Preston North End Football Club. Both guys will box before. So uh, March the 7th in Manchester. Could actually be both guys on the undercard for that fight. Who's headlining that fight? Uh, could be Usyk Chisora. Oh. Yeah. Um, but we'll see what happens with AJ and Chisora. Uh, so AJ and Usyk stuff. Um, Fitz Fowler is a great fight. And I can't wait to do that again. Just got to get them both probably one more fight. Go and look good. And then make it. Make the rematch. You do you know? Do you think? Sorry. I am struggling to make weight, Anthony. Because I am not. Look at the back. 
It's one of my great, great all, all time. Did you mention Jordan Gill? Yeah, Jordan Gill was out. Um, was supposed to box at the end of this year. He'll be back in the spring as well. Martin Bacoli. Martin Bacoli's in an interesting position. Um, ready now to jump into the big fights. I'm kind of a bit disappointed that... And I know like we fuck around like us and Warren and all that, but that offer for Bacoli to fight Dubois is there. And Daniel Dubois is a really good young fighter, but the level of opposition is disappointing. And I feel like the Bacoli fight is a really good fight for Dubois. I don't have a problem with the money. Whatever you want to pay um, Bacoli for that fight, I'll, I'll back him in that fight. But... You know, if if Joe if Dubois not fighting Joe Joyce again, I have no idea why that fight ain't taking place. It's supposed to happen six months ago. If he doesn't fight him in April, then we should just make the Bacoli fight. It's a really good fight, and I'm looking to put him in a big fight. So if we can't get Dubois, then any of our other guys, you know, Povetkin, Hergovic, Hunter, Parker, um, Gassiev. Any of those guys, I think he's a great fight for Martin Bacoli. I think he's he's a he's a dangerous fighter, and I think he's underrated, and I think he's going to be in some great fights. I will start chucking twos at you now. Uh, oh, yes, yes, bro. Uh, Tommy Cole, yeah, uh, and Kieran Conway. Tommy Cole, um, I'm not sure what the future holds for Tommy Cole. Obviously, the one in Madison Square Garden was supposed to be like the last one. Then he come back and said, quite like one more. Now he's had the time to reflect on it. I think he'll be making his decision in the early part of next year. Million percent behind Tommy. Top lad, top boy. He's had a huge amount out of his career, in my opinion. Got some great memories. You know, I know he lost to Derry Matthews, but boxed there, outdoors in Hull. Boxed Campbell outdoors in Hull. Uh, the Brazuela fight was down, still probably one of the best fights of the decade so far. Great win over Michael Katsidis. Unlucky not to win the British title uh, against... Tyrone Nurse, um, good fight against Chris Algieri, boxed at the Madison Square Garden, boxed in in uh, Boston as well, good win out there, so he's had a great run, Tommy, and doing great things for the community as well. Absolutely. Kieran Conway? Kieran Conway, just saying, Tony there, maybe look at the Ch Ted Cheeseman rematch for next year, um, he's had a couple of fights now, he's ready, he'll box in the spring. Kieran Conway ready to be put into big fights next year. Robbie Davis Jr. and Jamie Cox. Jamie Cox, um, again, been inactive for a long time. He was actually supposed to fight on one of our Italian shows. Had to pull out, he wasn't well. I'm not sure what the future holds for Jamie Cox, but again, he's had a good run. We support him 100%, whatever he wants to do. Um, who, who was that one? Jamie Cox and who's you say? Mm. Robbie Davis Jr. Robbie Davis Jr. Looking for a new training team. Um, we bring him back in the spring as well. I really rate Robbie Davis Jr. And what I like about Robbie, you would have just heard it off camera. We were just talking to Tony Sims about it. Good mindset, good work ethic, very serious about his career, very, um, very, what's the word? Very, very driven in his career. I wonder whether he should fight well, boy. That's not even knowing how well he makes weight. But he's a big 140. So, might like to see him come back maybe at a catch weight, but he'll probably read this and watch this and say, what the fuck's Aaron talking about? I'm 140 all day long. So, but um, he'll be back. Big fights in Liverpool. And uh, he'll have a comeback fight. And then I would like to see him box on the Fowler Fitzgerald card as well. Paul Butler. Paul Butler is boxing. I think Joe's got a show coming up. Again, it's quite frustrating in the uh, bantamweight division with the uh, World Boxing Super Series and sort of all the belts tied up. Paul's not officially with us, but you know we'll help him out and look for opportunities as we do with Joe. And I think again, he's just waiting for that big fight. And I think he's got a European title fight as well. And and you know a fight that I'd like to see him in, maybe a Cash Farouk fight. You know, a new yeah, signing. I mean, sign, again, yeah. like Paul won't be looking at the Cash Farouk fight thinking that's a fight for me. But you've got Lee McGregor, Cash Farouk's interesting little domestic division, but all those guys looking for bigger fights. What's happened to Scott Cardwell? 
Scott Cardle, actually I was just typing an email to Scott Cardle before you go. Scott Cardle, I'll let him make his own announcements, but uh, I think that Scott now, you know, he, he lost to Burns, was looking to come back, and then I think again, like, Scott's someone that we signed, he was our first major signing, or first signing from the amateurs with Scotty Cardle. I didn't know what I was doing back then. And he was, you know, a guy that we took to British titles, boxed on some big shows. Probably feels like he hoped to get a little bit more out of his career than he did, but still had a good career, won British titles. Um, and I think I think now is the right time for him to walk away from the sport. He's got a great family. He's got um, he's got a great family. He's got um, lovely wife. She's expecting their, their first child. You know, I think now's the time for him to look look beyond boxing and um, start a new chapter in his life. John O'Carroll. John O'Carroll. Bit disappointing for John O because he was supposed to fight Scott Quigg. Um, that was going to be on the Joshua card. Joshua card in Saudi, and looking to reschedule that fight for probably early March. Got to catch up with Scott this quick. Scott this quick. Scott this week and find out how his elbow is. I don't think it was a, a major injury like it was originally. And hopefully he'll be ready to go for that. Could, could be a fight March 7th. Yeah, we'll quick was the next one, but Luke Campbell. Luke Campbell, great fight against Lomachenko. Really interesting with Luke, what's happened. Because Devin Haney, you know, Luke had to fight Lomachenko for WBC world title. All of a sudden, um, Devin fights for the interim world title. Lomachenko gets elevated to franchise champion. Devin Haney gets elevated to world champion. And Campbell's thinking, fucking hell, I had to fight Lomachenko. I could have won the interim or I could have fought Devin Haney or whatever. Devin Haney gets injured in his last fight as a shoulder operation, won't be ready till June. So, and before that, they ordered a final eliminator between Fortuna and Campbell. Now, Haney is in recess and the world title is to be contested by Luke Campbell and Javier Fortuna. It's all crazy, but the fact is, Luke Campbell's next fight will be for the world title against Javier Fortuna. Negotiating that at the moment, purse bids are at the middle of January, looking to make that fight probably land in America, but could land in the UK. And the winner of that fight will fight Devin Haney. So nice little run of events. Rocky Fielding? Rocky Fielding, again, ready for a big fight. I mean, had a really good uh, run out last time on the MTK show. Great knockout. Just ready for the big fights. I think all those guys, you know, you've got Martin Murray as well around that weight class who they're just looking to jump into the big fights now. And, you know, whether that's UK or US, you know, Rocky will be looking for big fights. But I think he's got plenty left in, in the tank, Rocky. You know, obviously lost to Canelo and that was a wonderful experience but looked good last time. I think Jamie Moore's a great trainer, doing a good job with him. And uh, I think uh, he's got some big fights ahead. Sam Eggington? Sam Eggington has just like completely transformed his career. He was virtually done and now comes back and has a big win in Italy. And he's like top 10 with a few of the governing bodies now. I think top five with one governing body. So Sam, look, the interesting thing with Sam was we, we made him an offer to fight Sizoko on the... Uh, Saudi card a lot of money and he turned it down and he would never turn the fight down and he, he was an underdog in that fight but interestingly like he's obviously now looking for the right spot and he's, he's made money so maybe he's looking I want to get on a winning run so um, we'll see what happens in 220 what's happening with Ricky Burns Ricky Burns will fight again uh, good fight with Lee Selby last time out very close fight we know Ricky would fight six rounders but I want to try and get him a big fight Maybe something in Scotland. We have to see what happens with Cash Farouk and others as well. Um, but I'd like to see him fight, even if it's I can't say a farewell fight because I honestly don't know when Ricky will stop. Don't like it's us. not it's not that Ricky's like it didn't look in his last fight that he was shot or had nothing left in the tank. It was a close fight against Selby. He lost the fight, um, but he just loves it. He loves it, and um, he'll definitely fight again. In the first half of this year. What's happened to guys like Jake Ball, Reese Bellotti? Um, Jake, I think, is um, out of boxing for now. Reese Bellotti, I haven't spoken to him other than after, straight after the last fight, which was a very close fight in Italy as well. 
I just think that sometimes you've got to decide what you want out of life. You know, for us, Jake Ball and Reese Bellotti have probably got to the, le- the, the highest levels. I'm saying not that they can go, but you know, like, Reese, I believe, could win a British title. Maybe Jake Ball could, but I'm not sure they're going to go beyond those levels. And that's just me being honest. So I am very fond of them. I mean, Reese Bellotti, I, I think, is, is so entertaining to watch. Very nice man. Jake Ball's a, a nice kid. His dad's a lovely bloke. They both drive me mad. But they, you know, his dad cares massively about Jake. And I don't want to see... I mean, Jake got beat and stopped by Craig Richards. Reese lost on points. Hasn't really been stopped other than by um, Ryan Doyle. Um, I just want to see him happy. happy. You know, if they want to keep fighting, I'll support them. But I think you're going to get to a stage where... You know, Reese, I think, has another title fight in him. Jake, I'm not sure. Um, but for now, no no immediate plans. Did you mention Kez Ashfak? You... No, he might be on February the 8th. Um, Kez, I think, is someone that can really start moving at a great pace. Every time we've stepped him up, he's won with ease. And I think sometimes they don't realise, not how good Kez is, but how ready he is to go now and I think in a super bantamweight division and those kind of divisions you've got to move quickly otherwise you're just not going to get the noise and I'm looking at hopefully making Kez on the February 8th card in uh, in Sheffield and I think he's ready I think I really feel like he's ready for some big titles Natasha Jonas um, not officially with us anymore with, with MTK again that you know the Terry Harper fight I think is a good fight I've offered that to them before I think the the issue with, with um, Natasha is whether she stays at lightweight or, or super feather, but she's having a lot of these marking time fights. She's got to jump in into a big fight now and take a risk. Liam Smith and Stephen Smith. Liam Smith um, has had a good year. He's had three solid wins, great experiences, boxing in Liverpool against Eggington, in Mexico and just in Phoenix, but we haven't delivered the big fights that he's really after, and that's the plan for 2020. I think anybody at light middleweight, Liam Smith, is more than good enough to hold his own against. And that's what I'll be looking to do with MTK is to deliver him a big fight for the spring summer. Um, anyone. I mean, I, I really feel like, I said to him in Phoenix, if Kel Brook doesn't get Amir Khan and can beat Mark DeLuca, I think Kel Brook against Liam Smith is a really good fight. Mm. And I think that's one that we should just try and make. Stephen? Stephen is back. Um, I think with Stephen it was... Didn't really know what his future held. He's come back, I think, now with three wins. Looking for a big fight. Up at lightweight. I don't think he's going to make 130 anymore. Um, and again, we'll be on the lookout for Stephen for something big for him. I think he just wants to end his career, really, with, with a big fight and a big chance. And if he can win, the, win that and take that chance, he can move on. If not, he can hang him up. Gamal Yafai. Gamal Yafai is fighting for the Europeans. He's had a nightmare, Gamal. He tore both biceps. One bicep in one fight then was coming back after, God knows, five months out, and then tore the other bicep a couple of weeks before his fight. So, thankfully, he's come back with a run out, and he's now got a European title fight against Rigaldi. Probably take place in Italy, which is okay, um, on one of our Italian shows. And I think he can win that. I think he can win the European title, and I hope that he can finally kick on. Made a great start to his career, up and down. Nightmare 2019. I promise 2020 better things for... Uh, Dalton Smith. Dalton Smith. Wanted, wanted him to box in Sheffield. Won't be ready for Sheffield. We'll be back in March. Very good young fighter. Like Kez Ashfak, someone that should move much quicker than maybe first anticipated. Very good fighter. I think one more fight, and I really think he can fight for sort of area titles and um, stuff like that. So I think Dalton Smith is an exceptional talent. Lewis Richard, I know you mentioned he will be returning. April the 4th, we're looking at for Lewis. I think he's in a great position. Great fight against Robbie Davis Jr., one of the fights of the year. Um, hugely exciting. Massive fan base. Great guy, great team. World title fight in 2020, I think, but just it's difficult. You know, you've got two champions in Ramirez and Josh Taylor. Um, so we really want to get him a good name for April the 4th and a, and a fight that the fans can get excited about. 
Sean McGoldrick, are you still working with Sean? Ben yeah, Ben-Gold. obviously he suffered his loss. Yeah. So he'll be back again. If we do the World Wales card, all these guys, when when they come back from a defeat, you've got to get one win and you've got to go straight back in. And if you can win that, you're back on the horse. If you can't, you're up shit creek without a paddle. So with Sean, get him the get him the win and then gamble and then see where we're at. Do you still work with Marcus Morrison? Uh, unofficially. I mean, he won on our Italian card. He's boxing on Joe Gallagher's card. I think I, I like Marcus. I think he's a good fighter. Exciting, looks the part. And uh, yeah, I think we can um, look to see him in Manchester. What's happening with the McDonald brothers? Should Gavin may go. box on the February 8th card. He's going to be in line for the European title actually coming up. Jamie again looking to throw him in a big fight. I think his head's back on it now. And um, I'd probably like to see Jamie fight um, at featherweight or super bantam and be in a big fight. You just talked about obviously Galahad is returning in the yep. final eliminator. So do you expect, if he wins that, do you expect that rematch with Warrington? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, Josh Warrington's going to be allowed the unification fight. We'll see what happens with um, the Shakur Stevenson fight. I can't see that in a million years they can come up with the money for Shakur Stevenson. We will see. Um, and the winner will have to fight the mandatory, which will be Kid Gallagher. Eddie Hearn. Yes. A what? Yeah, yeah, your plan. My plan? Um, I put something out on social media earlier. Don't complicate things. Don't tell yourself, go, how many times do you go into 2019 and you go, right, I'm going to do this, I'm going to lose a stone, I'm going to not eat this, I'm going to achieve this, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go on holiday there. Just keep it simple. Say that this year's got to be better than last year. Isn't that the best way to be? You know, I mean, we've had an amazing year of ups and downs. But if I can have a better year next year than I have this year, I'll be a happy man. Stay healthy. That's that's actually a focus for me. You look like you trimmed a little bit. I've trimmed a little bit. I keep getting bloodshot like eyes from the all the travelling and like screens and stuff. If anyone's got any good tips for bloodshot eyes, other than Boots eye drops. Let me know. There is. Um, a, but, I know we love talking about you. There is just a couple more. Mm-hmm. I know that strictly you have worked with them all year, so I will mention obviously David Price mm-hmm. um, and also Tom Little. Mm-hmm. Derek Chisora. And yeah, I was going to come on to Chisora. I'm sure there's other fighters we've missed, so again, like we'll be here all day. We've gone so, from the UK based okay. fighters. So I US know. guys are for another interview with maybe more of a global platform. Yes. Um, and. So let's talk about David Price. Happy to give him another fight. Always exciting. Um, Derek Chisora, we know the plan is to try and fight Usyk, but we'll see. Where are you with that? I think at the moment, the WBO are saying Usyk's the mandatory for Joshua. The IBF are saying Pulev is. And I'm saying, guys, you can't, like, there has to be an order here. technically first? IBF. So maybe we have to get a court ruling. I don't know. So all we are, all we want to know is, is guys, you need to just tell us who's first. So are they obviously in conference? Conference. Uh, everyone's talking, aren't they? But I'm saying to my my conversation with Usyk is, if we're told that the WBO are first, we will fight you. If we're not, then the the Chisora fight is there, and then you fight the winner of Joshua Pulev. So Usyk's in a great position as well, but obviously everybody wants, if they can, the biggest fight now. Oh, shit. Yeah, so um, Tom Little, again, no, I don't have a responsibility to Tom Little other than I like the geezer, and I think he's hilarious, and I'd love to have him on another show. Last one, really. Do you think we forgot anyone? Probably, but again, right. Like, reeled off a lot of names mm, there. Trying to think. Yeah. Because there's loads of, obviously, you, we're your international home now. And you well, very much so. Yeah, very much so. That's yeah. for another time. Mm. Um, Dylan Wire. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen? Got a call with him later today, actually. I think I uh, actually got, I think I got a missed call from him. Looking to fight in April. Wow. Possibly in the UK. I mean, again, it all depends sort of Joshua, Joshua's next fight. 
Usyk, Chisora, Dillian White, where we're going to place them and slot them oh in. Oh my God! Yeah? Yeah, mate. That's easy to do. Go on, mate. Um, I love the Andy Ruiz fight for Dillian White. Will they take it? Probably not. I like the Povetkin fight for Dillian White. I think that's an absolute war. But ultimately, all these fights for Dillian are great. We've got to get them a world title fight. So we've got to see where we are with the WBC. And where is that, Edward? That we're not the mandatory till 2021, which, as you know, I do not agree with. And I believe that he should be mandatory. I mean, the worst way for Dillian is that Fury and Wilder box in February, Fury and Wilder box in October, and he gets the winner. That's the worst way. But I think it should happen sooner than that. But the truth is, Dillian's not going to fight for a world title next. So let's identify and establish and book that fight in. Get the right opponent. Could he fight reason. on the same card as Joshua? Unlikely. Unlikely. Possibly. Unlikely. Um, so yeah, that's what we'll be speaking about today and locking everything in in the new year. Let's talk about Fury Wilder. Yep. Formally announced uh, mm -hmm. last week. Mm -hmm. 22nd of February is expected at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Great fight. Great fight. I mean, the first fight, I got stick the first fight. I said it wasn't a great fight. It wasn't a great fight. It was unbelievably dramatic. The 12th round was epic, and what happened with the knockdown was great. Big fight for the heavyweight division. Um, yeah, I mean, re good fight for boxing. Joshua wants the winner. What else should we say? I do not understand not doing a press tour. I mean, you weren't happy about that. Well, I thought it was a little bit strange because there's massive potential for... It's just laziness. Press it's laziness. Because why wouldn't you do a press tour? So I was like, oh, well, they're going on a big college football show. So they don't need to do a press tour. Of course you need to do it. You're telling me for a fight of that magnitude, you are not going to do a media tour. What, what's all that about? <laughs> Tell Eddie to answer his phone. <laughs> um... So, how can you not do a media tour for that? I don't understand. Are you bidding for it? Because we saw some... Am I bidding for it? Well, as in Sky. Yes. Are you going... Well, you know that. You've seen the comments. I mean, I don't, yeah. don't want to... Luckily, Bob Arum's got a bigger mouth than me. So, he's told the world what's happened, which, quoting Bob Arum, is, we've had a big offer from Sky, and BT had the right to match it, but that is all. I'm, I'm surprised. Um, I mean, BT, I mean, they've had to put on all these drab fights from Fury. Now they get the big kahuna and they don't even have it. So, yes, an offer has been made from Sky. Have they gone in? Have they gone in? Yeah, have they gone in? It's a substantial offer, but it's a substantial fight. Now BT are in a very awkward position because they have to match the offer, which their platform says they can't deliver those kind of numbers. Or, you know, in my, in my opinion. So do you want to do a pay-per-view? You have to understand, this is not... It's not boxing people who make these decisions. This is finance people. And board a director level that look at the numbers and say, well, that's now a risk to us. Why would we do a pay-per-view in the first place? To make money. Now, we might end up losing money. So, no thank you. You know, from, from Frank's point of view, he can't afford to lose this fight off BT. He looks ridiculous. But he's got nothing to do with it. And he palmed it off very nicely in your interview the other day where he said, it's up to BT if they want it. Which is surely not the um, spirit of the deal, which was when Tyson Fury gets a big fight, someone else gets it. I mean, that's not really how it works. But that's how it works now. So BT, as you've seen from Bob Aaron, what he says is correct. They've got... They want the fight, they've got to pay up and get it. Great for Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, by the way. You know? But strange. And if it ends up on Sky, we win. And not as in we win, you know, but as in Sky win. And if it doesn't, no problem. And BT get what they probably should have got in the first place. Um, but it's interesting. A little soap opera built within a fight, isn't it? I mean... Um, but it is uh, a much anticipated for the fight course, itself. Of course, big fight. The landscape of the heavyweight. Big fight, <laughs> monster fight, um, <coughs> intriguing fight. I um, hope Tyson Fury wins. 
He won the first fight. And when does Joshua go out to camp? Depends when the fight is. So probably middle. No, it's end of June. camp. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Don't know how that's going to work. But I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if he went out there. He ain't going out there. It's a bit weird because he might fight the winner. So it would be a bit strange. But I don't know. Josh, Josh is his own boss. If he fancies it, he'll just go. Don't matter if Rob says or I says. No, I mean, he'll just go. But don't want to open up that cup. Can't see it but happening. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great fight for boxing. Again, I wish they'd do a media tour. This is... Like, can you imagine with those two characters... Fury and Wilder. Can you imagine me going, do you know what? I think we'll leave the media tour. I'll be straight on a plane. I'll be London, New York, LA, wherever. Timbuktu, don't give a fuck. Get it on. Whatever it costs, do it. I wonder whether Wilder don't want to be around Fury. Possibly. Mm. If I was Fury, I would have insisted on that media tour. Maybe Fury. No. Fury... One of the ways Fury wins the fight is by doing the media tours and getting in Wilder's head. It's a disadvantage for Tyson Fury not to have the media tour. Think about it, Cook. Mm, yeah, like Klitschko. Exactly. Would he have won that fight against Klitschko if he didn't have the first press conference prior to camp and the sit down and the face to face? Okay, Batman. Hmm. All right, well, listen, what what other news can you tell us? Nothing. We've done two hours. Not quite. We're like 10 minutes away. This is terrible. Hours. I don't know if this is good content for fight fans. Like, it's too long. No, it's not. never too long with you. Um, what else? Nothing, really. Just... So, talk to, just tell me, just sum up your first quarter of 2020. What okay, you hope so to happen? January the 30th. I mean, this is all... I mean, what we know is... Well, all we know at the moment is Jan 30th, Feb 8th, right? But in an ideal world, I'll tell you what is going to happen, okay? January the 30th, done. Andrade against Luke Keeler. Tevin Farmer against Jojo Diaz. Uh, Danny Roman against Ahmed Lear, the Unified Super Bantamweight World Championship. Triple header, plus Jake Paul against Anderson Gibb, right? No, you love that, you? you? love that. Whereas you do love that. How many rounds is that? Six. Okay, that's Miami. I say we are now it's February 8th, Feb 29 as well, Garcia Vargas. February 8th, Kel Brook, Mark DeLuca, Kid Galahad, Claudio Marrero, Terry Harper, Eva Wallstrom, Dave Allen, etc. February 8th, Sheffield. February 29th, Mikey Garcia, Jesse Vargas. Hopefully, Kalia Fire against Chocolatito. Like to also see the return of our new flyweight world champion star Julio Cesar Martinez on that show as well March 7 now we start getting that, they're all done March 7 now we get to the potentials yeah Chisora against Usyk Manchester Arena okay March 28 uh, possibly Kelly against Abanesian Conor Ben against Johnny Garton etc etc or Usyk against Chisora on that date April the 4th uh, March 28th as well, possible Gennady Golovkin date. April the 4th, Lewis Ritson, Newcastle. April the 18th was going to be um, uh, Devin Haney. Could actually be Dillian White on that date. And then we're moving to May for Joshua against Pudev. And loads of else happening in America, of course, but that's the main UK focus. So Joshua... Likely to be... May, I think May, yeah. May? Yeah, end of April or May. But again, a lot depends on Dillian when he goes. Is that all right with you? Or you got something planned? I mean, what are you doing? Going through your calendar? No, no, I'm, just, I'm just checking. I like to know dates in advance. But I can't tell you. I, I, the reasons I do is the interviews. Don't take it, those things, when I say planning as gospel. Don't start booking holidays and then moaning at me when it falls in April. Oh, fucking hell, eh? I've no, booked an not. holiday. That's the kind of thing you normally do. Oh, Ed, have you got any shows around here because I'm planning to go away? All right, mate, let me just try and work it all out for you and just you make sure that you can... You at Wembley in April that never happened. Actually, and now it's... So this. fucking sue me. I'm just saying. Like, man had things to do, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I've had calls from Dillian. Um, okay. 
Um, can I just show you something quickly? Um, just tell me your opinion. Awesome. This is a young amateur boxer mm -hmm. called Joe Cooper. I'm going to show you this little clip and just give me your. Tell me what you think. Red or red or blue? You know. Surprised they didn't continue. Just well, it's very. I mean, it's ten seconds of footage. Looks like a sharp kid. Yeah. What advice would you give it to the young? Well, he's wearing an England vest, so he's obviously doing going around the right thing. This kid is convinced that you'll be signing him soon. Probably too. will be. Very good chance. What my advice to what for his career? Yes. Just work hard. Related to Billy Joe Saunders as well. Is it? Yeah, I saw that in the way he fights. My advice to any young fighter is just work as hard as you can. At the end of the day, if you work as hard as you can in whatever you do, you can't ask for any more. Keep life simple. Don't overthink things. Don't worry about things. Just do the best you can. Then, ultimately, however you look at yourself, however you value yourself, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you know you couldn't have done any more. The worst thing is to have regrets. So it's no point overcomplicating something to a young kid and saying, what you want to do, mate, is you want to do this and sit down and have a medium-term, short-term plan, long-term plan, strategy, this, dreams, write it all down. Fuck that. Just work as hard as you can. It's simple. And if things don't go your way, you need an awful lot of luck in life. Right? It's not just a case of, oh, you work hard, you have it off. Don't work like that. But I do believe the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I believe in karma, and I believe that the more you put in, the more you'll get out. So for any young kid and for anyone in sport or in business, very, very simple. Just do the most you can. Don't go to bed at night thinking, oh, you know, I didn't really do much today. A bit of an easy session. I had a couple of hours off or didn't really get that done. Just go to bed knowing another day banked, couldn't have done any more. And I think that's such a great philosophy. Not every day. You're not going to be on form every day. Some days you're going to wake up, you're going to feel like shit. You can't be bothered. You're going to go in. You're going to just sort of coast it out a little bit. Some days you might be a fighter. You might do your run. You didn't push yourself quite as hard. That's understandable. But overall, work as hard as you can. Or work that's everything you've got inside you. Get it out and, and do what you can. And then life will play out how God wants it to play out. And if you don't believe in the man upstairs, then how karma will make it play out. But you can't do any more than that. And, and when you're old and you're 90 odd, or if you. God willing, you make that age, you look back and you can say to yourself, I, I gave everything in my life. If not, you will have regrets. But at the end of the day, remember that, you will be sitting there one day thinking, I worried and panicked a lot about stuff and it really didn't mean fuck all, did it? Because now I'm about to snuff it. Sorry to end on a, on a doubt note. So enjoy life, work as hard as you can, be a good person. That's my advice to, to the, the kid as well operate in the right way, respect your family, most of all respect your parents, be polite, be a good person, be someone that people go, nice kid he is, you know what I mean? Follow in the footsteps of people that have achieved, but also follow in the footsteps of people who everybody would say, he's a great guy, Anthony Crawler. there you go, there's, there's a good example of someone who you should be like in boxing, there's others as well. Just before. What about you, Coop? This way. 2020. More views, mate. More views. More views. Do better than 2019. Of course. Are you still, are you still focused? Are you still motivated? I'm bang on it, mate. That's why right. I'm oh, yeah. here. Day before. Uh, I mean, you're expanding quite. You know, you've now got Andy, Umar, and Oscar. And Oscar. That's the full way at the minute. Think about new recruiting. Yeah. In the new year. Like you don't that. really get any, get rid of many of them, do you? Just like... Not like because they're good. Yeah. Then they'll get better. You're happy. Yeah. What, um... Yeah, 2020, I'm going to smash every other YouTube channel out of the park. Ooh. A bit aggressive. No, not really. Just do our own thing, innit?
Yeah, right. Yeah, mate. Do you want to smash every other YouTube channel out of the park? Why would I? But in a nice way. You want to smash them out of the park in a nice way? In a nice way. In a, in a friendly, competitive, like, all right, mate, come away. Yeah, all right, mate, all I'm right, going to mate. smash you out of the park. Do you want to be a Lovely. There we go. Your top three, no context home. Oh. Top three. Um, my darling, you were the headband, you're a different grade. Can't you do it in the voice, Ed? Like, come on, this is like New Year. Give them something. My darling, you the headband, you are different gravy. There you go. Right, that's number three. Um, I love you. I go back to performing seal. You were like, go on it, do something for the new year. Go on, do it when you do that thing. Uh, my other favourite, no context term, is... The backlash makes me horny. That is, that is one of my favourites. And I've kind of gone off, I'll go on then, because it's been absolutely, like... Last night at the darts, I must have done about 30 oh go on them. So like people come up to me going, do it, do the oh go on them. What's the other one? Um, well, do you know what? We've got a load of mugs. Wait there, let me get the mugs. Actually, here we go. So I, got, I couldn't bring them all back. But one, one that, um, one that, uh, I couldn't bring back. He goes, no, 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 I'm not having this. That's one of them. So I spoke to my man from No Context Hearn, just to confirm, I do not run the No Context. Will you back me up on this? No, you, like, you don't. I don't have any involvement with No Context I don't know for certain, but I'm pretty sure that you don't. Fuck off, mate. What, mate? Don't mug. Mate. Be honest. You, do, do you honestly think I have an involvement in this account? I think you've got shares in that motherfucker. Mate. I'm joking. I Good, don't because it's actually some it people actually, saying, I can't believe, how egotistic are you to create yeah. this account? No, no. It actually you. This is a guy called Andy, I believe he worked for the NHS. So he made these with a company called, because they sent it to me. They sent me all these mugs. Terrace? Terrace, that's it. Terrace. Enjoy the mugs on behalf of At No Context and, and ourselves at the Terrace. A great launch to be involved with. Please do us let us know which chosen charity you like to percentage donate to. So I, I came to me and said, they, I came to me, <laughs> that me, they came to me and said, would you mind if we'd done these merchandise range? I said, no problem, but it's a bit, a bit cheeky because it's my quotes and it's your videos. My videos. But yeah. if you can donate a percentage of charity, I'm happy to do it. So they came back and said we would. They sold like nearly 4,000 mugs or something like that. Yeah. And they've donated three grand to my chosen charity, which is... What's the percentage, by the way? Again, I don't know. I mean, prof, percentage of the profit. Okay, I mean, yeah, listen, it doesn't matter. Listen, this Andy geezer, he, he's on it all day. So he's obviously making a few quid out of no context. Huh? Congratulations. If you can make money out of my expense, good luck to you. So anyway, I think it's like three and a bit grand to Haven's House Children's Hospice. Oh, oh in, uh, Yes, so thank you very much okay. for that. So okay. here's a couple of my favorites. You, uh, this is actually. Let me go back a bit and get you right in yeah. shot there. So the backlash makes me horny. That's my, one of my favourites. This is another good one. My God, I feel terrible living in your head, Renfrey. That's another one. This is probably my all-time favourite. This is a great one for a cup of coffee. Don't let the bastards get you down. And this one, actually, I think this is my favourite. Ooh, how convenient! There you go. Where's the cheeky little fucker one? Uh, I don't know if they've done that one. They do do one. Did they? Did you? Yeah, I know. Do you remember that one? Who did you call? So when we say my fucker? top three, you cheeky little fucker. That that's that's. Who did you call the cheeky little fucker? The backlash makes me horny. I love the way you're three plotting them like chess pieces. Ooh, how convenient is another one. Yeah, do you know what? Okay. Top three. The backlash makes me horny. Ooh, how convenient. You cheeky little fucker. That's my favourite, cheeky little fucker. So there you go. I've actually learned to embrace no context, hand. I think it's quite amusing now, actually. I hope you don't get milked too much in 2020 and it can just carry on. I think if you stop doing interviews... I've probably made it, probably done a couple in here, I know. There's been a lot in here. Eddie, have you got any closing words before we've done? We've done two hours, mate. We've definitely done two now, yeah. 
I would just like to say thank you. I would like to say thank you to those that have supported our fighters. Thank you to those that have supported Matchroom. Thank you, to, I guess, thank you to those who haven't and motivated us to work harder. Um, keep supporting British boxing. Keep supporting people who are out there trying to achieve their dreams. If things don't work out for fighters in fights, don't give them too much of a hard time because it's a tough sport and they're trying their nuts off. To you at home, good luck in 2020. I hope you have a great year. I hope it's a great year for you and your family. Um, I hope that you can achieve everything you set out to achieve. Keep things simple. Live every day as it comes. You never know if it's your last day. You never know how important that day is. Every day, just know what you've got to do on that day and do it. Work hard, play hard, enjoy your life. We're here for a good time, not a long time. And we look forward to another great year. And I promise you, I will work as hard as I possibly can to make the best fights and do the most of my fighters and the best I can for the sport of boxing. Thank you. I've both subtly branded AJ Boxing this interview and all. Well, AJ Boxing Apparel is also available. This is a little team tracksuit. It's lovely, isn't it? Who sent it to you? Oh, I, I nicked it in Saudi. Oh, did it? Yeah. It's nice, isn't it? Hmm. Edward, thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you, thank you. Two hours with Eddie Earn, a day before Why is it killing me? 2020. Keep it real, mate. Cheers, boys and girls. Thank you very much.